So now you enroll at Texas Western. Uh, who are your basketball coaches? Because at Texas Wex, uh, uh, at Texas Western, you primarily uh, are playing basketball now, right? Right. Yeah. So who are your coaches at Texas Western, and 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 uh, what are you, what are your memories of them? Well, Harold Davis was my coach when mm -hmm. I first got to El Paso. Harold Davis had been there three or four years. Uh, really, he just passed away a year ago. Really, a great man. I mean, he. He was the he, he was a running coach. I mean, he you, you pushed it up the floor, and he, he, you took your shots. And that sophomore year, uh, I averaged right at 22 points a game. And coming back into the border conference, I was the leading scorer coming back my junior year, and that's when they his family struck oil or something, and he resigned, and Coach Haskins came in and took his place. I was then. Uh, so I played for Coach Haskins there the two years, uh, and the team had never in the history of the school gone to the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. And of course, we got some pretty good players in. But when when I was with Harold Davis, I was the only black on the team. Okay, the only. Mm -hmm. you know, and the guy who broke the black color line was a guy by the name of Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown came in, made all conference. He was 25 years old, went to Amarillo Junior College. He transferred out there, but he said, oh, I was in high school watching him play. So he became my hero, my mm -hmm. idol. Mm -hmm. And then some years later, when he was through, uh, I come up there. And, and, and so there was just never many black players. And then Ask Coach Haskins comes mm -hmm. in, but Harold had already recruited three other black kids mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, bad news, Jim Barnes. Yeah, came in and there. I played against uh, Jim Barnes. Okay. So when when they they came in there, we we went to the NCAA tournament, and that's why I said most of the times that you know even though Coach Haskins changed where I, I averaged thirteen point seven, fourteen points a game my south my junior year, and down to ten, well, both of those years we almost made the NCAA. One of the the first year, we were probably I guess back in those days they only took maybe thirty two teams or twenty four teams, wasn't many taken. And we became independent. So we had to beat Houston out. Notre Dame was independent. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some very good schools that were independent in mm -hmm. basketball, especially on the East Coast. So yeah, we, because you didn't have the Big East no. in conference. I because uh, your your time and mine mirror each other chronologically. Yeah. And Villanova was an independent. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we got to go, and I, I went from scoring. To become a defensive specialist looked like it. I mean, I guard every every player that came in and had to uh, had to guard. Him. And so, Coach Haskins had changed my role dramatically from a scoring guard, small forward, to a, a defensive player that could score. And uh, we went to the NCAA tournament. And I told him, you know, sacrificing points, giving me the opportunity to go to the tournament, was a hell of a lot better than me maybe having 30 points and then go back home and it was over with and wait for the next year. I wanted, I wanted to play tournament basketball, so that's yeah. what happened. No, and as we know, Don Haskins went on to be a Hall of Fame coach and made uh, just significant contributions to the game in a variety of areas. What impact did he have on your coaching philosophy? Coach Haskins had a tremendous impact on my philosophy. First of all, it deals with, with discipline. Mm -hmm. I mean... Now, he was the ultimate disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. You know, he, when we walked on the campus, if we saw him, we were going to go in another direction so we wouldn't have to pass by him. Because mm -hmm. if he passed by him, he's going to ask you, where are you going? Mm -hmm. you ought to be, are you supposed to be in class or something, you know? <laughs> I never forget one time we were down in the pool room there in, in, the, in the sub building, we call it, and playing some shooting pool. And we were missing a class. <laughs> And he walked in and he said, what are y'all doing? Aren't you supposed to be in class? And, and he says, damn it, none of you even know how to play. And we, we know, we think, hell, he can't play no pool either. And he was a pool, he was one of the best pool players in the world. He said, rack those balls up. He bust and we never got a shot. We're like this looking at him. Mm -hmm. blue, blue. He said, now get your butts to class. Yeah. And if you want to learn how to play, come see me. I'll teach you how to play. 
man, we talked about that forever. I said, man, did you see what he did? <laughs> he was a he had a reputation as being a pool Big shark. Big time shark. Yeah. Oh, I heard man. That. Yeah, he comes down there and beats you to death, boy. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he just, to me, that was, he, he showed us that he could outplay us in the first place. And he <laughs> and said, so if you know, if I can do what I did to get out of school, you guys can go to school and get out too and play pool. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, but he was a, he was a guy that, uh, uh, there were some things that, that I, I didn't care to be a part of. Like he had rules where back in those days you couldn't bounce the ball into the post, post play. He didn't, he didn't believe in bounce passes. Certainly you couldn't skip it, mm -hmm. you know, skip it over the top. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you never really, I don't think in those years I ever played a zone. It's all man to man. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, that was it. Mm -hmm. if you and I, he would always say, anybody that plays the zone is admitting they can't play man to man. Mm -hmm. That's 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 defeating mm -hmm. to him mm -hmm. and to the Iba family. Okay, so all of his coaches and everybody played for him developed that kind of philosophy. I did to the point where when I started my high school career, we used to pass the ball. I mean, it was nothing for the score to be eight to nine at halftime because we were going to pass it and we we're going to try to guard you and we we're going to do all the things, but we always lost. Why? Because we couldn't out rebound anybody. We were too, we were really small. Uh, we never got cheap baskets, you know. And then, so I took part of his philosophy of discipline, hard work, that was important. You know, and, and making kids, uh, li you know, making them uh, play as hard as they can every time they compete. I think I think that was the thing that impressed me the most about Coach Askin. To me, he could take a player that was here and maybe bring him to here and take a player that was here and bring him up to that level mm -hmm. and kind of balance you out. Uh, I, didn't, I, don't, I never saw a player go from here and go like this. They would always seem to be balanced, and that's because of his style of play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Nate, Nate could score and do all those things, but Nate didn't score very much. Nate Archibald. Nate Archibald, yes, and Bobby yeah. Joe Hill, and mm -hmm. David Ladin, you know, yes, all yeah. them guys. If they played on other teams, yeah, they would be, but that's not the, that wasn't mm -hmm, his style. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it also gave me the, 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 uh, the deal that if I were to play everybody and work on the kind of defense that he had taught and discipline, then I could play more guys. Mm -hmm. In other words, instead of playing your customary seven or eight, mm -hmm. I could easily play 10 or 12 guys. Mm -hmm. I could play, and I'd always have a deal set up where I'm gonna try to play all of you in the first half. You got five minutes, you got two minutes, but I didn't. I never did tell them that this is the only two minutes you're gonna play. You play those two minutes and you can, if you're playing good, you can stay two more, that's up to you. Yeah, yes, so yeah. that gave them, so I developed that kind of a, a concept of the game. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I'll give you what you want. If you don't want no more, I bring you out, you can sit down. Mm -hmm. And and what happened was, those big teams with 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six kids were big in those days, they didn't like pressure. So I started tracking and, and scratching and you start getting cheap baskets and easy layups and stuff of that nature. So now my little offense will hit a few jump shots. But you, when you depend on your jump shot and it wasn't falling and you weren't that big, and you I don't care how much you blocked out, they just reach over and get the ball and, and they wouldn't call it nothing. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather take my chances of trying to get the ball back and not throw it away. Mm -hmm. so, so it created a style for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that had to do with Mexico. See? Mm -hmm. When I used to go play, I used to play in Mexico. We used to take a team of the miners, which were the Bobby Joe, David Latin. I mean, we're talking about all Americans. We'd go play the little team over in Mexico who had a little protein, and they beat us 20. And the only reason they beat us 20, because the first half, we might be 20 up. But by the time they got through running us and pushing and running and running, hey, we would. We'd take seven guys, but we're tired. Yeah, you did it. It didn't wear us out. Took your legs from my head. Yeah, just yeah. took them. No, and who, uh, tell us uh, who is Bert Williams and, and, and what uh, role did he play in your life? Bert was, Bert, uh, when I met Bert, I was, I played baseball and he asked me to come out and play softball. I was a young kid in high school when he, when he first started with Bert. And he'd followed my career and Bert was an official. 
a referee in basketball, a, a really good one. And we got to be pretty good friends. And and uh, I started playing baseball with his with his softball team. Matter of fact, Bert made All American and they won the World Series the year that I was there with him. And one night after a baseball game, he and I went to the Oasis restaurant. I knew I couldn't go in and eat. And I told him, I said, Bert, I, I can't go. He said, come on. And at that time, he was an old, alderman. You know, Bert was a pretty sharp guy. Mm -hmm. And he was like me. He was a white man who spoke perfect Spanish and lived in the same neighborhood at one time. Mm -hmm. So that's the, his nickname was Pacarito. Pacarito means little bird. Mm -hmm. Bird, bird, mm -hmm. you know that. And he, 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 was, he was better than I was. Mm -hmm. And there he was. His, his mother, he didn't have a dad. They lived in the South Side. He was the only white kid that lived basically in the South Side. So mm -hmm. we kind of had some common connect. identity. Yeah. And so he, uh, they told him that they couldn't serve me. And he turned red as a big boy, and I, he could tell because he was competitor. He was a competitor as a baseball player. He, I mean, he'd have said, he said, come on, Nolan, let's go, let's go, Sam, let's go. He got in his car, boy, and he was, you know, he just sit there and he hit that damn thing for a while. He said, this shit's going to change. This shit's going to change. And he drove off, took me home, dropped me off, boy, and he went to war. Well, before he the, ended up becoming the mayor. Okay. Yeah, he became the mayor uh -huh. later on. But he went in and, and got, that was the year before King and, and every, the, the civil rights. The year before that, Bert Williams got it done in El Paso. You know, he, and I think because of that, the Jim Barnes, them guys, at first, they wouldn't have been able to go to the movies. They wouldn't have been able to go to this. Ain't no places. Mm -hmm. But he got that change made it a lot easier for the Askins to recruit better. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you talk about not being able to go to the movies, etc. Even during your time at Texas Western, you and your, your fellow black teammates still were confronted with overt racism. When you'd go on the road, you still were encountering situations where, as black athletes, there was no play. You couldn't stay with your white teammates. And, and, and that, you know, you had, by that time, though, you had to be getting to a position in your own mind where you said, you know, I, I'm just not going to take this no more. Yeah. Well, you couldn't. Uh, the old lady stayed with me a lot, uh, which was my granny. Uh, I think the hurting part of it was in college life when we were getting ready to go to Centenary and play the tournament and, and having such a, a good start. We won maybe our first five or six games. And to be called in and says, we got to leave you here. And I thought, well, when I, I thought at first maybe it was because I was injured or something. And mm -hmm. he says, no, nah, go on, go on. It's, uh, they got a rule. And that rule is that they can't, blacks can't play on the floor. Mm -hmm. So you guys are going up to Centenary in Shreveport, Louisiana, and playing the tournament. Playing the tournament. And the coach calls you and tells you, you have to stay home. Right. Mm -hmm. Day before they left. Mm -hmm. I stayed home, and in those days, you listen to the radio and listen to the game a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they got beat all three games. Mm -hmm. So they come home. They come back home six, we're six and three. Mm -hmm. Now I'm ready to rejoin the team. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that angered me big time. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, I, I, as I thought about it, I said, you know, if, why, if you want to change something, you said, okay, we just not going to go there. If, if one of my, if my players can't play, then we ain't going. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. They said, oh, they would sign this contract and we can do this. And they, you know, they called me in and talked, tried to talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. I listened and then I walked out knowing exactly that, uh, what that was all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At that age, at that time, you know, I, I was pretty mature at that time about what was going on in life. So uh, I, I put that behind me and went on and went back to work and tried to try to see if we could win some more games. Mm -hmm. No, and do you remember the time one of your teammates and a dear, dear friend of both of ours, Andy Scoggin, was one of your teammates at Texas Western. Do you remember the time he confronted Don Haskins and asked 
why uh, he wasn't starting. You know, because as we here we are today, and we talk about Haskins starting five blacks, and Andy confronted him at one point because he didn't feel he was starting enough blacks. And I, as I understand the story, when he confronted him, uh, Don had him come in the office and and he opened up the drawer. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about the story. Well, you, you know, you got Andy played a little bit uh, with my team and with some of the national team. So he's an in-betweener, we call Andy. Uh, uh, what Andy did was, you know, there was a time when, when, when Coach, when I was there, we had three or four that could, that could play. Never had to worry about trying to start five. When Andy got there to play, they had a possibility of, of starting five. And at that time, Coach Haskins, at that time, Coach Haskins was kind of doing what everybody else did. You had like a quota. You play X number of blacks on, at home mm -hmm. more, or you could take them on the road and play them more. You, you know, so when you went on the road, you could play four. At home, maybe play three. Mm -hmm. You know, playing those kind of games. Uh, and because he, he approached me to ask if that, if you know, would I be offended because I was a captain that year? We could have started four, mm -hmm. just because we had four on the team. Mm -hmm. I told him no. As long as I get to play, that's what's important to me. Mm -hmm. It's all about. It wasn't about starting at that time. And so, uh, that that's what happened with Andy. Andy approached him and told him uh, during that time. Like I said, I wasn't I wasn't there because he came. Andy was actually took my my during my spot when I left and Andy was, because he would give me relief. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I left and he, he was the guy that became the defense especially. But what Coach Haskins did, he was like every all the other people who come to, that was, he was about 30, 31 years of age, out of Texas. His first black, his, his best friend was a black guy that they do the stories on now. but. His first encounter with black players was in Texas Western. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember him telling me many times they would ask him, uh, guys, coaches would say, "How do you get to coach? How do you coach blacks? Mm -hmm. What do you say to them?" You know, he said, "Hell, I say the same thing I say to whites." Mm -hmm. You know, you know that's that's what he would tell me about some of the things that. He would. But I, I found out as he went on. He, he decided that if I'm going to be successful, I'm going to play the best five. And that's what now he told me that himself. He says, mm -hmm. Nolan, I was, I was determined whatever I had to do to win, I didn't care what color it was. Mm -hmm. If it happened to be white, fine. If it was Mexican, fine. But I'm going to play the best five that I can play to win. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what Andy may have pushed him to, to make a, uh, you know, a concerted effort to play the best five, mm -hmm. and and forget about what the town is going to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nolan, you were on the team, uh, the team which became the first team in the history of Texas Western to to secure an a invite to the NCAA tournament. Now, what, what that had to be a heck of a thrill for you. That was the big thrill, and um, you know because that's all we did as youngsters is sit around and look at the NCAA and how can we get there, and, and we finally made it. My senior. That was my senior year uh, to get there, and and then of course the next year they go back again, and it looks like he wanted to, uh, in his first second year in the movie, but his fourth year he won a national championship. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that was a uh, you could see it coming. You could see the players. Uh, you know, I became a, a coach in the city. And I still did almost all the recruiting for him. I was going to ask you about that. That, <laughs> that I, I've heard stories that even uh, that you were a, a, a big factor in the recruitment of most of those the great black players that ended up playing on that Texas Western team. Tell us about what happened. You're back now at coaching in high school. The Texas Western is bringing the black uh, basketball prospects in to visit El Paso. Tell us about the role you played in that, Nolan. Well, Coach Haskins, you know, I always stayed pretty close to him. He could call me in and he said, hey, I need some help, Nolan. I said, what do I need? What you need, Coach? He says, you know, we got some players here, but, you know, they don't know nothing about El Paso. They don't know nothing about, you know, the tradition here. And he says, you could really help us. He said, you're still young enough. You just finished playing. These guys are knowing, they, you know, they'll, they'll listen to what you got to say. And now you're a high school coach. 
uh, I said, I'll help you. And the thing that I did was, he would call me and says, okay, we got a hill coming in, or we got a Latin coming in, or we we bring it in and buy a new barns. Of course, he came when I was there to recruit him. But what I would do is, I never spent a lot of time on the recruiting when I brought him into the city. We didn't have uh, a lot of things, social life for blacks. So social life took place in Mexico. And I knew Mexico like the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. And I'd take them places and we'd go out and take them, they'd never eaten Mexican type food and all that. I'd take them there, they'd have a great time, they'd party, they'd dance. I mean, we just have a great time. Mm -hmm. said, man, create your own social yeah, life. We created it, man. Mm -hmm. And so they knew I could get that done and not be worried about something happening to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'd experienced that and it was it was pretty good experience to get those guys. And you could see them, how they would enjoy themselves. Some of them didn't ever want to go back. You know what I mean? Like, man, can we, coach, you think we can spend another hour or two or three or four, you mm -hmm. know, just to continue to have fun? And that's, that's what I think was the most selling point is selling social life to them as opposed to just college life. Mm -hmm. Yeah.